right, thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me into this talk. So I'm Peter Denton, I'm a scientist at Brookhaven, um, which is on Long Island next to New York City. And uh, I do neutrino theory. So I think about neutrino oscillations and how they change flavors throughout the earth. Um, and uh, I also do uh, some astroparticle physics. So high energy particles traveling through space, which are then detected in detectors of the earth. Um, and there's, there's a lot of interesting experiments that we currently have and on the horizon uh, related to these kinds of measurements. So it's a very exciting field, I think. Um, and then through this, uh, through the connections between ASP and Brookhaven, uh, Eves came to Brookhaven, and I think he'll tell us a little bit about his story on that side of things. But um, then through Mary, he got in touch with me, and I've been very lucky to get a chance to, uh, to work with him. And, um, and he, he will be telling us today about a very cool project that we did that we wrapped up and uh, are um, currently in the process of getting, uh, hopefully getting published. So uh, that's, that's the story here. Uh, thanks, Peter. So, Eve, please go ahead. All right. So, I'll uh, share, share your screen. screen. Yeah. So, hmm. All right. So, all right. Sorry. All right. Uh, so, uh, all right. So, uh, good, good afternoon, or good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me to the African School of Fundamental Physics and uh, Application Online Seminar. So, I mean, my name is Yves Kini, and um, today I'm going to discuss a paper that Peter and I wrote this year uh, that you can find on, on the archive. And uh, the paper was recently submitted to PRT, uh, Physical Re Review Journal. And the idea was to see how a uh, future neutrino telescope Grain and polymer can be uh, can be used to constrain the tau neutrino nucleon cross section at, at ultra high energy. So uh, before before getting started, I'll, I'll quickly introduce myself. So as I mentioned earlier, my name is Eve Kinney, and I'm originally from from Burkina Faso, West Africa, right here. Actually, I grew up in in Cote d'Ivoire here, and uh, I did my primary school and my secondary school in Cote d'Ivoire and moved to Burkina Faso when I was roughly after my A-level. So there I got my bachelor degree and my master's degree in physics at the University of Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. I also worked roughly five years as air traffic controller and it was kind of hard to combine uh, having a full-time job and working, I mean, and doing physics. So at some point I decided to focus more on physics. So yeah, now I'm doing physics full-time. And I've also taken part in the African School of Fundamental Physics and Application uh, in, in, in 2018, it was uh, in Namibia. So it was held at UNAM, University of Namibia. So it's really an honor for me to be giving um, uh, this talk today, given that I was, I was a student two years ago at the same school, yeah, pretty cool. So um, through the SP program, I've been able to move to, to the US and um, precisely at Brookhaven National Lab New York last year uh, from August 19 to November 17, where I did uh, an internship. Um, so under the supervision of Mary, Mary Bishai and Peter Dinton. So yeah, what I will be presenting is kind of uh, what we, we did. So, I mean, I wasn't alone for uh, during this internship program. There are a bunch of people who were there too. Um, so maybe you can recognize some faces, Tialo, Somialo, and the others. So it was a, a great experience. Uh, recently I've joined, I've joined Professor Anna Watts group at API, uh, Anton Panakur Institute for Astronomy. It's in the Netherlands. So I'm working as a PhD student and uh, working on um, on uh, X-ray, X-ray neutron star using an X-ray telescope, a NASA X-ray telescope uh, called NICER, which is located on the International Space Station. So yeah, I mean it's a new journey. So yeah, it's pretty exciting as well. So um, now I'll get to the to the main topic and discuss uh, what this uh, this talk is all about. 
So this is an overview of what I will be talking about. So first of all, I'll introduce some basics concept. And uh, I mean, having attended the, the ASP myself, I've realized that not everyone has like, a, everybody has a strong, uh, strong background in particle physics. It was like people come from different backgrounds. Some did material physics, some did uh, electronics and depending on the country um, that it come from, and the, the, the program can be completely different. So I will, I will, I'll go through some basics concept and to make sure that um, we are on the same page and we're speaking the same language so that people don't get lost. And then I'll talk, talk about, I mean, the motivation, why we decided to do this work and why is it really important. Also, I'll talk about um, GRAN and POEMA, those two nutri future neutrino telescopes, which will be used to, for neutrino detection. I will also talk about the simulation and uh, the simulation code that we use and the parameters. And yeah, finally, I get down to the result and, and conclude. So uh, let's get to the, to the basics concept. I mean, at this stage of knowledge, we know four fundamental forces in, in nature. So uh, the first is gravity and the second is electromagnetism. So electromagnetism is the, the force which um, between charged particles given by the Coulomb law. And people are more familiar with uh, these two forces, gravitational force and electromagnetism. And the two other forces that people are less familiar with is the strong interaction or the strong force and, um, and the weak interaction. Um, I mean, coming to the strong force, I mean, we know that the, the nuclear of, of an atom is made out of protons and, and neutrons, right? So if we consider gravity and electromagnetism being the only force in nature, the nucleus of an atom shouldn't be stable because of the repulsion between the protons. But we know that the, 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 the nucleus is stable. That means that there is another force overcoming that, 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 that uh, repulsion, those repulsion. And this, this, this force is called the, the, strong, the strong force or the strong interaction. On the other hand, the weak interaction only appears in, in few, I mean, in some nuclear processes such as the, the beta decay. So in the beta decay, for example, uh, you have um, a nucleus which tend to emit a pro, uh, an electron or a positron and um, some, un uh, uh, some uncharged particle usually um, called the neutrinos or the antineutrino, depending on which charged particle was emitting at the, at the beginning. So those are like four, the four fundamental forces uh, in nature, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong force and the weak force. So the standard model of particle physics, I mean, at the beginning, I mean, we, we used to believe that um, the atom was the, the, build, the fundamental building blocks of, um, of matter in nature. But at some point, when we started looking closer into the, the atom, we found out the atom was made out of protons and neutron and, and electron. And when people started building uh, particle accelerators, they started smashing maybe protons together. And they found out that the protons were made out of other uh, fundamental particles. So at some point, we started to wonder, so uh, what are the um, fundamental building blocks of every, every matter in nature? So according to the standard model, which is the, the theory describing fundamental, I mean, elementary particles and the interaction, all the building, I mean, all the matter in the, the, fundam the building blocks of all matter in nature, except from black, dark matter, of course, it's made out of six core and, and six lepton and uh, with the anti particles, and on top of that, we have like six, uh, I mean, a four gauge boson and um, a one scalar boson. So the, the gauge boson is pretty much what gives uh, the particle exchange during, during I mean, uh, during um, when the part, I mean, uh, the gauge boson are particle exchange when the quarks and the lepton interact. And uh, the X boson is kind of, uh, in the simple way, what gives mass to, to particles. So here I'll, I'll focus more on the on the on the leptons, precisely on the neutrinos. Uh, the reason is that the neutrinos are really weird particles, and I will probably suggest you to 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 go back. I mean, to 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 see to watch them them 
the lecture that that Mary gave on the, um, the neutrinos, the little pre, uh, the little neutral one. This was a great lecture. So, I it explained a little bit um, what neutrinos are, and uh, I mean, on the big mystery behind the neutrinos. So, I mean, neutrinos are really weird particles that uh, they almost do not interact. I mean, they interact, but extremely rarely. So it makes them hard to detect or hard to study. So I was focused on the neutrinos, especially the, the tau neutrinos. So as I mentioned, uh, neutrinos almost do not interact. And when they interact, they interact through two, two uh, interaction channels. What uh, interaction channel? So there are two modes of interaction. The first mode or the int first interaction channel is called uh, the neutral current interaction which happen roughly 30% of the time. And uh, during the neutral current interaction, the neutrino comes here and interact with the nucleon by exchanging the Z boson. Remember I told you that, that when particles interact, they exchange, um, I mean, uh, the gauge boson and the gauge boson exchange here is the, the Z boson. And then the neutrino ex exchange the Z boson with uh, a nucleon, which can be a proton or a neutron. And then the resulting particles is still the neutrino, which carries away roughly 80% of the initial neutrino energy and the bit, uh, emit a bit of shower. So on the other hand, when it's interrupted via the um, charge current interaction, what happens is that we have a neutrino coming interacting with the, the proton or a neutron by exchanging this time uh, a, w, a W boson. The resulting particles is uh, a tau lepton, which will propagate, eventually leave, uh, lose a, a bit of energy and produce a, a shower. And um, that shower most of the time carries away roughly 80, not 75% um, of the energy of this tau, tau lepton and produce amino. Um, and we have a secondary particle, which is still a, a tau neutrino, which, which is produced. So those like, uh, those are the, the two ways of interaction of, um, a tau neutrino when they interact. So remember they really, they interact rarely, but when they do interact, this is the way, the two ways that um, the two channels that, that they interact in. So um, they talked about the, the motivation, why we decided to do this work and why is it really, really important. So as I mentioned earlier, the neutrinos are the list of particles, so they really, they really interact. It means that their cross section is very, very tiny. So it makes them hard to detect and hard to study. So um, the standard model being one of the most sophisticated particles, I mean, a theory in, in physics has predicted what the, the neutrino nucleon cross section is. And um, uh, the cross section is pretty, pretty much the, the probability of uh, uh, of a neutrino to interact. And as physicists, we all have to, to test, I mean, to make, to, to do, to make some, some, some experiment, some measurement to confirm that the, that the prediction uh, fits, the, um, uh, fits the actual data, the actual measurement. So at low energy, uh, at low energies in the, in the gray region, a lot of lab experiments have measured the neutrino nucleon cross section. And uh, it's pretty much in good agreement with uh, what the standard model has, pred has predicted. So the green, the, the green line here is the neutrino nucleon cross section as predicted by the standard model. And those dots, those points uh, represent kind of the, um, the measurement done by, by, me that by, by labs. And as you can see, it's pretty, it's, it works well. And uh, as we go to higher energies, I mean, in the in this white region, we have like ice cube doing current measurement uh, in that energy band. I'll, I'll come down to it. Uh, what ice cube is, and and fast you know, which I'll, I'll explain later what fast you know is as well. So those like current neutrinos or future neutrinos um, telescope operating or uh, will that will operate in that energy band. And as we go to higher energies, uh, this is where the problem, I mean, we have a lot of problems because at those energy, we are currently we have no experiment um, 
doing measurement, uh, measuring nutri the neutrino nucleon cross section at that energy. So we, we don't actually know if the, if the prediction of the standard model uh, still works. And um, the blue and the the, the blue and the red curve represent different understanding of the standard model depending on the pattern distribution function that we consider. So depending on uh, how the, the, the gluon and the quarks are distributed on the, in the proton and neutron, we end up with different values of the neutrino nucleon cross-section. So we, we still don't know exactly what the, the value is here. So what we're trying to do is to see, to, to use future neutrino telescope, GRAN and POEMA to see how well can we constrain the neutrino nucleon cross-section at high energies. So that's why it's really important because with GRAN and POEMA, we'll try to, 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 to see how well those, those two uh, future neutrino telescope can, can constrain, in fact, I mean, the neutrino nucleon cross-section at, at ultra high energies. So as I mentioned, Fashion New is it's going to be a future neutrino telescope at 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 CERN at um, at LAC Large Hadron Collider. So this is pretty much the location of um, what where Fashion New is going to be located, and uh, this is uh, kind of uh, an image of I mean an image of what the actual detector will be, and Fashion New will, will detect. Uh, tau neutrino, muon neutrinos, and electron neutrinos at roughly uh, one one TeV. Yes. And Poema, and sorry, um, IceCube is that huge, um, famous neutrino detector built in the South Pole, and detecting muon neutrino coming. I mean, um, uh, roughly with energy between roughly few TeVs and few PeVs. So it's a really famous uh, neutrino detector. And um, it's been measuring like neutrinos, muon neutrino for a while now and finding some good constraint on the neutrino, uh, neutrino flux. So yeah, pretty famous uh, uh, experiment. And then we'll have Grand and Poema here, which will also in the future measure, I mean, uh, detect neutrinos or tau, especially tau neutrinos at ultra high energy. So yeah. So I've been talking a lot about grain and poema. So what is what is grain and what what is poema? So grain stands for giant radio array for, for neutrino detection. So it's gonna be a neutrino detector built probably in 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 China. At least this is the the the, the hot spot one. And what um, Grand will do is, is that it's going to detect cosmic rays, uh, roughly 100 cosmic rays per day, and um, and, and uh, tau neutrinos. So few, I mean, a few tau neutrinos during its 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 run period. So what um, it will detect tau neutrinos coming from interacting in 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 a mountain or now uh, Earth skimming neutrino. So what's going to happen is that. Uh, grand will be a bunch of uh, radio detectors. So those like radio, those are radio detectors, not not trees. So those ra radio detectors, th thousand of them will be placed on the side of a mountain, and detecting radio signal coming from the interaction of cosmic rays as well as uh, tau neutrinos. So it will be a lot of radio antenna facing an opposite mountain so that it can detect neutrino interacting in that mountain or earth skimming neutrino. And uh, the antenna will operate roughly between 50 to 200 megahertz and uh, detecting radio signal. So I'll later explain how can we detect uh, you know, a radio signal from, from, from a tau neutrino interaction. So POEMA in the other hand stand for probe of extreme multi-messenger astrophysics. So this is gonna, poem is gonna be a, a NASA, NASA astrophysics probe, which will detect uh, ultra high cosmic rays and uh, ultra high neutrinos from, from space. So it's gonna be a set of two, two satellite, which will uh, fly in formation between uh, roughly 525 kilometer to 100 
a, a thousand kilometer and will probably be launching to 2029 and uh, yeah, detecting neutrinos with energy beyond 20 PeV, right? So, I mean, how do we detect uh, um, some radio signal from a tau neutrino interaction? Uh, so what happened is that when a tau neutrino interacts, so we get the tau neutrino coming here and interact them with a nucleon, which is a proton or a neutron. And this is, it, it's happened, uh, it, the interaction has to happen via the, the charged current interaction. If it's a neutral current interaction, then, then it's, it's just another neutrino, which is emitted and then, yeah, it's, we don't pick up a radio signal. But if the interaction happened via the charged current interaction, so what happened is that the resulting particle is a tau lepton. And that tau lepton will, will propagate, eventually lose a bit of energy and exit the earth and decay and produce some shower. And that shower, in fact, will produce some, some radio signal via the so-called um, the scattering emission. So what I forgot to mention is that Grand will detect radio signal, but, but Poema will detect some Cherenkov of light. And uh, for the cost, I mean, uh, for, for the tau neutrino interaction, Poema will, will detect tau, um, Cherenkov light coming from the tau neutrino interaction. But for the ultra, uh, for the cosmic rays, it's, it's gonna be pretty much the fluorescent light that, that, that they will be detecting. So this is pretty much how uh, a radio signal can be produced from a tau neutrino interaction. So if you place a, a radio antenna here or a Cherenkov detector here, if you pick up a signal, then you can trace back uh, what really happened and uh, retrace uh, the, the trajectory or the history of that, that neutrino here. So, right, so let's get down to the, to the simulation because we want to know how many neutrino will be interacting through the earth and how many tau lepton will be getting um, we use a publicly available um, simulation package called New Tau Sim, and uh, it, uh, it it's available on that Git GitHub. You can quick uh, take a look and maybe download it and play around with it a little bit. So a New Tau Sim is a Monte Carlo simulation um, simulation code. So basically, it means that it is sampling code, meaning that for the same input you can have diff you can have different outcome so yeah I'll, I'll get down to it later so for new tau sim you get to you have to set a, a bunch of a, initial parameters uh, a bunch of input so the first parameter is the is the energy of the initial neutrinos so you have to to precise what's sort of the the initial neutrino energies and uh, the angle as well. So the angle gives you directionality. It gives you where, where the neutrino is pretty much coming from. And uh, the number of events is pretty much the number of neutrino that you are throwing in the code. So depending on how powerful your code, your computer is, you can throw in per, per run 100, uh, I mean, 1,000 or 10,000 or 10 billion, depending on, on how powerful your computer, your, your, your computer is. And then you have also to select the cross-section model and the energy loss model. As I told you that at, when we get to, um, uh, to higher energies, we, we, we I mean, uh, depending on the, on the pattern distribution function, we end up with different values of the neutrino nucleon cross-section. So you have to pick up one model, there are a bunch of, I mean, three models that you have to, you have to pick up. I mean, you have to make a choice and pick up one for, for new thousand to, to run the code. And then when you get all those input, you throw that into new Taosim, compute it, and it will give you um, um, it will give you an output which is a .txt file containing the number of charged current interaction, the number of neutral current interaction, and uh, one of the most important parameter is um, the number of uh, I mean uh, the the energy of the exiting tau lepton. So right. So um, we have modified a little bit new tau sim because the because new tau sim originally considered uh, the Earth to be perfectly uh, sphere, uh, spheric, I mean to, to be perfectly rounded. So 
what we want because grain will be facing a mountain we have to add a mountain to 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 the code so that um, we can see how many events will be coming from from the mountain so we kind of modify new sim a little bit so in order to to be able to to include some mountain configuration and a scaling factor so the scaling factor is that because we don't know what the actual value of the neutrino nucleon cross section is. So we take a scaling factor of let's say 0.1, for example. So it means that what if the neutrino nucleon cross section is not exactly uh, what the standard model has predicted, but uh, a tenth of that value, for example. And uh, then we, 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 we run the code. I mean, we, we, we just modify uh, the code a little bit and then we still get the, the, the same kind of output and then yes so this is this is what we did for 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 our work so i mean uh, to run the code with with uh fix some parameters uh parameters such as the initial tau neutrino energy so that was fixed to one eev 10 to the power nine gev because it's 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 that va it's at that value that we wanted to have an idea on the neutrino nucleon cross section and how well we can constrain that at, uh, how well we can constrain that we have all also set the um, um energy threshold to be 40 pev meaning that uh when the neutrino the tau lepton exit the earth with an energy less than 40 pev the code will disregard it the reason being that the because after the the tau lepton decays, it has to have, it, it has to have it, the shower has to have enough energy to produce some radio signal or some Cherenkov light detectable by the, the the detector. So if the energy is not high enough, then the radio signal is too low or the Cherenkov light is too low to be detected by the detector. So we set the the energy threshold to be forty PeV. And we also set the number of event to be 100, meaning that we have to, to run the code until we get 100 event. Remember, I told you that Monte, um, the code is a Monte Carlo simulation. So pretty much for the same input, you can get different, different output. So um, you have to, we have to run it until we get at least 100 event in order to, I mean, in order to, to to, to reduce the fluctuations. And for the energy, for the cross-section model and the energy less model, we have considered the one proposed by Amy Connolly and, and Al and, uh, and the one proposed by Abramovich and Al. So for, for Grain, because Grain will be facing uh, an opposite mountain, we have considered um, uh, the opposite mountain to be a hundred kilometer wide with six kilometer uh, has height. The reason being that, I mean, the, because of the topology uh, of the region where Grand will be located, this is the type of mountain that we will probably, we will probably be getting. And then we've set the antenna to be two kilometer on the side of the, up, uh, of the mountain and both mountain has to be separated by 10 kilometer. Um, the distance has to be 10 kilometer. The reason being that if the, the mountain is, is too close, then the, the shower get produced behind them, the, the radio, this radio, this, this radio detector here. So you, you don't get the, the, the tau neutrino will interact, but you don't get the signal because the signal get produced behind the, 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 uh, the mountain. But if it's, it's way too far as well, then the, the, the radio signal get produced or the fluorescence, uh, the, yes, the radio signal get produced, I mean, uh, before, I mean, uh, before the, 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 this, uh, the detector and uh, then before it reaches the detector, the signal becomes way too low and falls below the, the sensitivity, I mean, uh, of this detector. So the, the sweet spot is roughly 10 kilometers. So if you put it at 10 kilometers, then you make sure, then you are sure that you are getting most of the, the, the signal, I mean, or the neutrinos coming, interacting in, in, in I mean, on, on that, in that mountain. For grain, 
we've uh, set the altitude to be, because Grand, uh, I mean, for Poema, we set the altitude to be 525 kilometer. Uh, remember, Poema is going to be a, sat a set of two satellites. So, uh, and then the altitude should vary between 525 and uh, 1,000 1, kilometers. So we just pick up one value, five, 525 kilometers, the, the lowest orbit possible. And because the Earth is made out of 30% um, of, of Earth and 80% uh, 80, 80 of water, we have considered a water layer thickness of four kilometers and uh, the, the water layer density to be um, 1.02 gram per centimeter cube. There is, I mean, those values are given by the preliminary er reference Earth model, which is the, 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 the model that, that usually particle physicists use for the, uh, for the computations. So now let's get to, to, to the result. So um, here we have the, the number of events uh, per, per unit alpha, so or per bean. So you can just see the number of events per, 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 has a function of the, the angle alpha. So alpha is that angle here. It gives you the direction where the neutrino is, 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 is coming from. So beyond that vertical line, beyond that, that vertical line here, those like um, events coming only from um, not the, this, the opposite mountain. So those like events coming here. And um, below that vertical lines, meaning here, those like events coming from uh, only, only the earth. So events coming, events coming from here. And the different curve represent um, uh, the number of event has a function of alpha depending on the cross on the, on the scaling factor. So remember I told you that scaling factor 0.1 means what if the standard model, uh, what if the neutrino nucleon cross section is not exactly what the standard model has predicted, but a 10th of that, uh, of that value. So Gren, in that case, Gren will see, um, Gren will see something like this, like uh, the blue curve, right? So if it's not a 10th but a third, then you will be able to see this orange curve. It's, that's gonna be the general future. future. And then if it, um, um, it's half of it, then you'll see the, the green one. And if it's exactly what the standard model has predicted, um, especially um, the one we took, the Emmy, the Emmy Connolly uh, cross-section model, then we'll end up with uh, the the right uh, the red curve, okay. So you can you can see, as you can see uh, the most of the events are coming from the mountain, and as we go further down into the earth, as alpha decreases, we get less and less events coming uh, coming out. Uh, we we detect less and less event, and uh, it means that we get less and less tau tau lepton coming out. The reason is it is because when we go further down to the earth. So when we, we decrease alpha, when we decrease alpha, the chord length, which is the, the distance that the, the, the tau lepton has to, 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 to travel before exiting and decaying, it becomes bigger. Therefore, the, because the, the tau lepton will lose a bit of energy, I mean, it will lose energy. And if the, um, the distance is it's way too big, either the, the tau lepton will Decay before exiting, exiting, or it will lose too much energy and fall down uh, below the energy threshold. So uh, the code will just disregard those those type of in, uh, those type of in, interaction. So you you get more interaction taking place, but less and less even take uh, exiting because of uh, because of the code length, which is uh, too high, and because uh, of the density as well. Because the further we go down. The, the higher the density uh, becomes. So as uh, alpha becomes bigger, so as the chord length becomes smaller, we get more and more events coming out until we, re we, we reach a certain, a certain point where we don't have enough matter. And um, so we don't have like enough matter for neutrino to interact. And then the number, 
start to fall down. Okay, so this is this was for Gren and for Poema, it's all it's almost the same, except that we don't have a mountain. So as alpha decreases, we get and we get less and less events coming out as well. So it's pretty much pretty much the same as 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 the as Grant result. So here we have the, the chi square has a, a function of the scaling factor, and the chi square is kind of the deviation from this uh, from the standard model. So we have this chi square has a function of the scaling factor uh, for both Grant and Poema at, at different energies. Well, I mean, for Grant, um, the energies doesn't really influence them. Uh, how well can we constrain the the neutrino nucleon cross section, but uh, for Poema, it seems to, to matter uh, a bit because, like, as we go to higher energies, you can notice that we get less and less constraint on the, on the neutrino nucleon cross section. So, I'm, um, yeah, right. So, here, all right, so here we have the, um, the cross section has a function of number even. And uh, here we have the one sigma band. And um, well, here, as you can see, at, for a number of event of 100, if we assume that we'll, Grant will see a 100 event, we can, we can see that we can consider it for at one sigma, the neutrino nuclear cross section at roughly 20%. But if the number of event uh, decreases, if we observe less event, uh, events, it means that, 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 I mean, we get less and less constraint because yeah that gap becomes larger and as we 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 observe more and more events the gap the gap becomes smaller and we get uh, i mean a better constraint on the neutrino nucleon cross section well okay i'll i'll quickly conclude uh i mean um grant's gonna be um, a future neutrino detector operating at uh, one eev and det detecting uh, radio uh, radio radio signal coming from uh, tau neutrino interaction. Poema on, in the other end will detect Cherenkov light coming from uh, also tau neutrino interaction uh, with energy above 20 PeV. And then we we see that if we assume a number of event of, of of 100, we can we can have a pretty good constraint of of roughly 20 percent on the on the neutrino nucleon cross section. All right. I think, yeah, this is all. And thank you. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, I'll try to answer. Uh, uh, Peter will probably give you, I mean, uh, some, some, some answers. Or, so, all right. Thank you. Uh, Eve, thank you yes. very much for this uh, presentation. It's, uh, I'm very happy to see you. Uh, ASP alumni uh, do this work. I'd like to thank Peter for his advising and, and coaching through this process. That's really appreciated. I also uh, thank to Mary for finding the funds and, and motivating um, alumni to come to BNL last year. Um, so anybody has any questions? Uh, uh, I think you know people should ask questions. You can see that uh, Eve um, is now just starting his PhD, so he's um, not a professor yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you should people should feel free to ask any question here. Yeah. Any uh, questions? Hello, yes, yes, I have one question, please. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Please, uh, for the simulation, what software did you use, please? Okay. Um, I mean, right. So for the simulation we used, I mean, um, um, it's a code, uh, it's a C++ code called new tau sim. And uh, this is the name of the code. So new tau sim, and you can find uh, uh, the code on that GitHub. So you just type in new tau sim on Google, and and then you, or you can just copy this link, and then you you can get the, 
I mean, you can get the code. It's pretty, it's, it's not a complicated code to use, so yeah. Is it close of the GN4? Is it? Close of the GN4. Uh, okay, I'm not really familiar with, with Gen 4, so I'm not sure if I can answer that, but I mean, it's, 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 it's a code written in C++. I guess Gen 4 also is written in C++, right? Yes, it's also written in Gen 4, in, in C++ code. Okay, so I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, I don't really use Gen 4, so I, I, don't, I don't really know. I, and sure. in this code, can we also get uh, others, uh, other secondary particle apart from Sienkov or radio photon or else? I'm not yeah. sure if I, if I got you well. What do you mean by others? Like, um... because. Uh, can, I, can I interject a little? Yeah, I think I understand where the confusion is. So, uh, New Tau Sim, and Peter can correct me if I'm wrong, is an event generator. So it, it simulates the interaction of the neutrino. It tells you what particles are coming out from the neutrino interaction with the nucleus. It does not actually then take uh, the, the particle and simulate its interaction with matter. So Jayant 4 is what does the interaction of uh, uh, particles with matter. Usually in particle physics, we have two stages to a simulation. You have what is called an event generator which does the fundamental initial interaction, say, you know, proton, proton produces a Higgs. Then, uh, and then, and then the Higgs will decay to this, you know, this, this particle. And then uh, uh, that event generator, the particles, the standard model particles that we see, uh, then that feeds into a Jayant 4, which really is a detector simulation. So you have, you know, you have also generators like Pythia, like Jetset. Uh, these are all the initial stage, the first set of interactions. And then Jayant 4 is specifically for the interaction with your detector and how to form signals in your detector. And I see Peter has come online to explain it a little better. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, so Newtown Sim kind of fits into a weird niche category because it doesn't map directly onto the sort of LHC model of, you know, event generator and then GN4. Um, with the reason being that you have, you know, you have an initial interaction with the neutrino in the earth, um, and this produces a tidal lepton, but then the tidal lepton propagates in matter. And so, you know, there, there is a, uh, you know, a, a propagation in matter effect and included in Newtown Sim. Um, so Newtown Sim does uh, a number of things. I mean, this was designed initially for Ice Cube, but it, it works for our situation too. Um, and and use, you know, th this concept is called regeneration, which is uh, conceptually fairly, fairly complicated, but I think we have mapped it out in our case. Um, and so New Tau Sim does not include the detector in this sense. That's because the detector here is, you know, the, the detector volume is the atmosphere. Um, and so what happens is, as you showed on, on one of these slides, a, you know, a, a neutrino will go through the earth and possibly interact multiple times. Will interact, create a tau lepton, will then decay back to neutrinos. The neutrino can interact again, which can then produce another tau lepton, which can then decay back to tau neutrinos and so on. And new tau sim uh, accounts for all of this. Um, and then at some point, possibly a tau lepton escapes the earth. And then if it decays in the atmosphere, then, um, that that's as far as new tau sim goes. How it's detected in the you know how the radio signal or the electromagnetic signal is detected in the detector, that is a separate uh, simulation, and we did not um, we did not touch that part of it. We basically use the efficiencies uh, calculated by the experimentalists. Um, so new tau sim is, is not it it actually has some overlap with GM four in, in what it does, but GM four I don't think does this because the the scales for these propagations are so large. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if there's any connectivity between new tau sim and gm4 i don't think there is i think if you wanted to plug this in there you'd have to you know wrangle it yourself so usually you would use Jan 4 for like the detector itself right so you'd use new tau sim and then it will tell you what signal is reaching your detector and then you would use Jan 4 to and so the efficiencies for the detection probably come from a parametric uh, 
calculation, but you know, if you really want to do the experiment from the experimental point of view, you would so use I, GN4 for the for the final detector. Yeah. I think for radio experiments, I don't think that GN4 is, is suited yeah. for that. I, they have their own custom software, which is, yeah. is used in radio ex experiments. I don't remember what it's called. Is your yeah, no, I, yeah, astronomy and astroparticle use different things than, than, than GN4. I think it's fair to say. But it's, it's a good question because there are all these uh, pieces of software out there and different communities use different, uh, sometimes use custom made because JAMP4 does not do everything. It certainly doesn't do event, event uh, generation. That's why, you know, different, uh, so you'll go to the heavy ion community and they have different event generators. And uh, the neutrino community has a, so in, in neutrinos, we would use Genie for event generation and then, um, JANT4, that is uh, accelerator neutrino experiments, and then JANT4 for detector uh, simulation. And then you would go to collider community and do Pythia or JetSet or Alpgen or something for, uh, for the event generation. And then you go to, uh, to the astronomy, as, as Peter pointed out, and it's completely custom made, uh, specific to you know, particular signatures, uh, and no JANT4. So. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, I have a question too. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to your last slide? Just like the conclusion, I think so. This one? Yeah, yeah that one, thanks. Okay. Sorry. Uh, this is totally not my field. Probably my question might be a bit naive, but I see you're using like two detectors measuring two different energy regions. What, uh, what, uh, like what new physics are you looking for? Or what do you expect when you use uh, these two detectors in, this, in these two energy regions? But I have right, a feeling sorry, there's wait, some, uh... some important uh, theory behind having them in this energy region. I, I don't know, I'm not sure. All right, so sorry, uh, it's looked like I can't barely hear you, so I will use my 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 earphone. So yeah, uh, I, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, so uh, can you please repeat your question? My my question was uh, I was asking like, is are you expecting any new physics using these two detectors in two different energy regions? Okay, so um, the thing is that when, I mean, those, uh, right, so let's come a little bit here. Mm. All right, so, so what happens that Poema and Gren, uh, they have like some overlapping region where they both uh, operate. So Poema um, operate, like will detect neutrino above 20 PeV. So from DC region up to, I guess, 50 EeV. And then Grant will, will, will start at roughly one EeV, uh, which is roughly 10 to the power nine GeV. And uh, up to a certain, I mean, uh, to higher, to higher uh, energies. So what we did is to, we just considered the experiment. I mean, uh, we run the, we did the, 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 the study, of, of the, we did this work by setting the energy to one EEV. So uh, are we, are we, I don't think we are trying here to, to find new physics. Uh, this is not the exact goal. The goal is to see how well can, can we in fact constrain the neutrino nucleon cross section, assuming that uh, the, Assuming that that, uh, for example, the Amy Connolly uh, cross section model is is right. I, I don't know if uh, what I said makes sense. So I, I think that's I think that's a very good description of of what our goal is. There's um some uh, just to add in one little thing which we didn't fully realize when we started this out actually, but um we eventually realized and got some nice attention from experts. So I posted a link to the paper and you know, 
figure one in the paper, which I don't know if it was an Eve's talk, uh, might be helpful to look at. But at these energies, so, you know, so a neutrino is scattering not off a, a proton per se, but off a quark inside a proton. And, um, and you know, it, it, it's interesting to know how much momentum does a quark have in a typical proton. And this is not really possible to calculate from first principles, but you can measure it in other experiments. And you can translate it from those experiments to different contexts, such as, say, this one. And you might ask, you know, can you do that translation? And uh, for the energies that we think Grand and Poema will be able to measure at this, you know, around the one EEV scale, is that the is right at the energies where the uncertainties from lab measurements start to grow a little bit. Um, and so, in principle, assuming Grand and Poema get built, and assuming they measure a high number of events, say 100 or more. Um, and they do this measurement, it's conceivable that this will provide a small amount of information uh, into the PDFs, which are the partons, uh, parton distribution functions uh, of protons and neutrons. Now, even assuming all the optimal things, uh, the amount of information is not going to be very much. And the fact is, these experiments will take 10 plus years to you know, get online, and the LHC is continuing to improve. You know, so it's, it, this is not going to be any sort of state-of-the-art measurement. but uh, it's, it's in the regime where it's not totally ridiculous to imagine that this is feeding back into uh, PDF information, which is pretty cool, I think. And actually some experts who do these PDF fits um, contacted us about how to you know, tie this in and see which region of PDF parameter space um, this would be helpful for. So I, I think that's a very cool example uh, of what kind of physics this can constrain. And then of course, there are some new physics models where these sorts of things start to change. And again, since we're right at the edge of the lab experiments, in principle, some of these models could be viable uh, and, and could be tested in the neutrino sector. And in that case, you'd see the, the cross-section would change. And of course, that's exactly the constraint we would see. And we would see that the spectrum in all those plots that Eve showed would look different from the standard model when it looked you know, steeper or shallower or whatever. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. I don't know if, uh, okay, just one last question, just because of my interest, I've been probably not, I'm sorry, Kateri, for this. Please go ahead. Yeah, on, on your figure, I've just, I just like opened up your paper on your figure one. I see there's uh, ice, uh, ice cube and your, your detectors at the far end on your right. Just a random question. Why do you guys have like a better, uh, like error bars and the ice cube has large error bars. Sorry, Peter. And thank uh, you very much. Nice, nice presentation. Okay, so let me open the the paper. All right. Uh, all right. Pfft, I'm not sure, but oh no. Um, I can take this one if, if you uh, if you want me to, Eves. Oh, okay. Yeah, feel free. Um, so, so the method that IceCube uses is essentially the same as the one that we're proposing, which is to look at the number of events as a function of angle into the Earth. Um, and and so you know neutrinos get absorbed, uh, and so you know you have assuming an isotropic flux, you have more events from some directions than others, and that's that's how that's what we presented here. Um, but IceCube because it's smaller, it only goes to lower energies. Um, bye, Mary. Uh, so the absorption there isn't as much because the cross section, as we can see in this nice plot right here, the cross section increases with energy. So the absorption increases with energy. So at lower energies, there's not as big of an effect as you change angles throughout the earth. And, and that, is, that is the key factor here. Right? So for ice cube, they look at events coming straight up and they look at events coming from the, from the horizon and sort of that difference is you know, somehow related to the cross section. Uh, but again, it's not a huge effect. For Grant and Poema, since they're much bigger, they can see these rare but higher energy events. Um, this absorption effect is very, uh, is very considerable. And you can see that in those, those plots that Eve showed where the spectrum as a function of uh, acceptance angle varies considerably. 
Um, so all you need is decent angular resolution. And actually the angular resolution gets easier as you go to higher energies because it's easier to reconstruct the shower. You get the direction very precisely. Um, so a good angular measurement and uh, just higher absorption rates I means, you know, you, as you go down an angle into the earth, the flux falls off very rapidly. And so measuring that rate of flux falling off tells you the cross section. But yeah, ice cube, I mean, it has pretty good statistics. So, but that apparently isn't enough to help out. <laughs> At least not yet. They, they have, you know, more statistics in the can. So they, they will get better. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Eve, why, what's the magic number of a hundred events? How does that, um, why did you choose a hundred? Why not 200, thousand, what's, <laughs> what's, what's the reason? Uh, okay, uh, I mean, uh, so I mean, um, why did we decide to, to run the code until we get a hundred event? Or why did we decide to uh, assume that if we see a hundred event and then we'll be able to constrain it to to uh by 20 percent because like those like yeah, those, well of... you can answer both questions for us okay so um the first is why did we decide to run it until we get i mean a hundred tau lepton coming out it's just because we want to reduce the fluctuation i mean because it's a simulation it's a monte carlo simulation you want to reduce the um, uh, you want to reduce the, the, the fluctuation. Yeah, but the more you run, if you run more than 100, you reduce it even more. So why don't yes. you go higher? More than I, I, I agree, but it also depends on how powerful your computer is because it, it, it takes like uh, a lot of uh, time to, to, run, to run the code. Mm -hmm. So pretty much, I mean, it's, it's, at some point you have to, to, to try to see how uh, what's the, um, what are you losing by, 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 by reducing the time of run, for example? So mm -hmm. what, how much information I, I, I mean, uh, are you losing? So uh, for, for some run, we did went beyond a hundred of event, especially for, for, for larger angles, because you have to run it more to, to, to reduce the fluctuation. But for 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 bigger angle, uh, I mean, uh, for for steeper angles, you don't you don't actually have to go until you get a hundred event. Like few events really reduce the fluctuation. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess it all comes to how powerful the computer is to to I mean, uh, uh, to to run the the code. And uh, Hi, yeah, yes, go ahead. Because I would like to have also something like that. Uh, if you want to run this type of code, if you don't have a very powerful computer, it will take many time because myself, this time I am running a GN4 code simulation in order to get Shinkov optical photon by using pions, P plus as primary, uh, particle, and when I run at this time, the the when I take the pounds at energy of three GeV, it is taking me at least two days <laughs> in order to get the result. <laughs> in order to get the result, but I have a core E5 seven generation, which is already powerful uh, computer but it's, it's very 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 difficult because like we we, we don't usually on our on our own computers it's difficult to get quickly the, the results in meantime it's like that okay too bad but but then when i was at, at bnl I had like access to a cluster and i could run down I mean, I had like supercomputer there, so I could I could just log into a cluster and, and run the and run the code. But like, if we get to the reasonable number is when you you, you run until you get a hundred event. I mean, visually you kind of notice that the the fluctuation reduces a lot. So yeah. 
And then now, why why is that taking a hundred um, uh, like um, right? Hold on. Here, like, why is that we decided to to take a hundred event to see how well can we constrain the the tau neutrino nucleon cross section? Um, it's hard to say because I guess in the I mean during the lifetime of 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 of, of for for the lifetime of 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 grand we are expecting few few neutrinos few measurement and uh roughly one to to 18 events but we did mention in the paper that that we'll, we are expecting more uh more neutrinos coming from other sources because we don't we don't actually know what the the actual flux of neutrino is at one eev so maybe is it reasonable to to consider a hundred event I, I guess i guess yes so yeah i don't know i'm not sure but you know <laughs> but i think it, it's not too optimistic to to take a hundred event so but it's then reasonable could you how long would you run the experiment to collect the hundred event is he is it like uh, does it take a long time uh, so what's the time scale we are looking at here okay what what we are plan what we uh the plan is to for the runtime of of grand we are we are expecting to detect 100 event during all the runtime of of grand that would be how many years <laughs> good question uh i I'm, I'm really i'm really not sure how long grand will, will run so yeah, I'm not sure. Um, and now, so when we, will these detectors be start collecting data? When what's what's the time scale when they will start operating? Right. So, grant is I guess it's not fully funded yet, so they're still looking for funding. So according to the white paper, they started like. Um, Building the the TELUS, I mean uh, the radio detector, back in two thousand eighteen, and I guess by twenty twenty five normally it should be should be working. I'm not sure of the the the, the precise date, but by twenty twenty five we should have a grand grand prototype three hundred, meaning three hundred um, three hundred radio detector already. Uh, fully fun uh, functional but yeah but still i'm not sure on the date because they still have to find uh the funding and the funding really depends on yeah people up who are putting money in the project so yeah. and the other experiment what, so so for poema for poema i think it's, it's fine and 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 um the satellite will be launched in 2020 2029 so by then it should be yeah Oh, you have become a professor by then. Say again? You'll be a professor by then. <laughs> so I can say a few words on the, the politics and the timing. Um, Poema is a satellite, it's not funded. Um, they, you know, they have a design and they're basically reusing the same design that they propose about every 10 or 20 years and just kind of change it up a little bit. And they're hoping that this one gets approved. Um, and of course, the satellite is an all or nothing. Either they either it launches or it doesn't. Um, Grand is you know this array of radio antennas, and the plan is to stage it up. And there's already the preliminary arrays exist. Um, the issue is actually not with funding. Um, China will probably fund it. I mean, I you know everything's up in the air right now with COVID, but uh, in the past they were saying that they would fund it. The issue is just um, doing the R and D and and developing a way to build a radio antenna cheaply enough that it satisfies the physics goals. And so that's what the collaboration is working on now. Um, and also finding locations is politically problematic because the places you wanna to go to are in the middle of nowhere in China and uh, you run into very strange local politics there that are very confusing to me. Mm. Um, but the, the expected lifetime of these experiments is, you know, they say it's on a three to five year scale 
um, grand, I assume, would continue to run at some level past that. I mean, at some point, the telescopes start to, uh, the, the radio antennas start degrading, but you probably don't need all of them to still do some science. Um, uh, as for how long it takes to get to 100 events, you know, it's again, th the three to five year time scale once you build the thing, which is probably at least minimum 10 years out. Um, uh, as for why 100, you know, the, the issue here is, is that unlike with, you know, most other things in particle physics, where you kind of have some idea about what's going to happen, we don't know what the flux is here. Mm -hmm. I mean, keep in mind for Ice Cube, they didn't know, what, they didn't know that there was a flux at all. And they measured yeah. something and, you know, they had many sigma, they've got hundreds of very nice, character, well characterized events, but they didn't know that was there. And actually, we still don't really understand where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. So here, at these energies, there's two possible contributions. One is a continuation of the flux that Ice Cube measured. Since we don't know what it is, it could be, you know, it could do anything. If it, and if it keeps going up to higher energies in a similar way, then this will be a pretty big contribution for Grand and Poema. Mm -hmm. But there's also another guaranteed flux which is nice. Um, there, there's a guarantee that there is a flux at these energies from cosmic rays scattering off of the CMB, in this case, pions and then neutrinos. And the typical energy is around one EEV um, of those neutrinos. And now there are still uncertainties on this of about an order of magnitude because of properties of cosmic rays that we don't know very well. I um, mean, actually, uh, you know, you can also show that a, a measurement from Grand and Poema will, will constrain properties of cosmic rays too, but that's, that's another thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that flux is in the one to 20 events per year is sort of the range there. Um, so that gives you, you know, but, but that's guaranteed and then there may well be other components. And so we kind of said, that sounds like about a hundred, maybe, maybe a hundred is a little bit optimistic, um, mm -hmm. but it's not too ridiculous. But it, it's, it's, there's absolutely no way to know what that flux yeah. would be. Yeah. That's why we, we did things in terms of number of events. I mean, we could have done it in terms of, uh, the flux, but the problem is the exposures of the experiment are also still being determined and they're still changing on a regular basis. So, you know, instead of convolving two unknown things together, we just stuck with one unknown thing. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that, no, that's understandable. Other people have questions or comments? So what is the status of uh, the paper now? And do you, do you two have other, other, uh, other ideas or other things that you are working on or that um, will be coming in the future and so forth? Uh, all right, so uh, recently we got the, uh, we, we got the, um, how can I call it? Referee. Like the referee report. Mm -hmm. So we kind of like corrected and uh, resubmitted. So we are currently w waiting for, I mean, uh, the final decision. So if the paper get approved, or I mean, we can still get another uh, referral report. So we just cross finger that, yeah, it just get accepted. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, no, this is, go through. sorry. I, I think it's pretty likely to go through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, okay, so I think this is this is very good. I'm really pleased that uh, uh, you know you guys have done this collaboration and have this nice paper coming up uh, from uh, from uh, Eve uh, spending um, some time with us at BNL. And uh, this is the kind of things we want like, we like to see more <laughs> of, uh, you know, ASP uh, students and alumni. So, um, and uh, yeah, I'm also happy that if you are doing your PhD now in, in Amsterdam, do you, have you decided yet which one, what will be your PhD topic? Um, I mean, currently I'm working on, on, on a neutron star. So uh, the goal is, to try to understand some uh, phenomenon ab observing in uh, during neutron stars, uh, accreting neutron star outbursts. So we have that this burst oxidation in oxidation in 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 the neutron star uh, outburst. I mean, a flux 
that mm -hmm. we, we still don't understand. So, yeah. So this was the project trying to 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 see what's really going on okay. and what is the causes of the, the what is causing this fluctuation and, and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Um, any other question? Any other comments? Um, so, anyways, you have. Uh, um, you have Peter's uh, email and, and also uh, Eve's email on uh, our Indigo agenda page. Uh, please, please feel free to contact them for more questions about this study that, that is here now, about any other um, possible collaboration that, that might interest you. Um, if there are no other comments or questions, I would like to thank uh, Eve. And, and Peter for agreeing to come in and talk to us today. And uh, I, I hope that in the future, um, uh, African School of Physics will have the opportunity to, uh, to have Peter to come and lecture in person and also uh, to have uh, Eve back to give a talk. And, and that's also one thing we want to promote. We want alumni to, to come back and tell us what's going on in their professional lives. So this is, has been very, very good. Um, so if there's no last question or last comment, uh, Peter, uh, uh, Peter, is there anything you want to tell our students or alumni or? All right. OK, so then in that case, I suggest that uh, we uh, close the meeting for, for, for today and uh, we'll be in touch. All right. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Thanks. Goodbye, Professor. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.